Hi, Will. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. How are you doing? I am not complaining. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are William McCaskill. You are a professor of philosophy at Oxford, uh, co-founder of two NGOs, Giving What We Can and 80,000 Hours, and author of this book, Doing Good Better, which is what we're going to talk about, um, How Effective Altruism Can Help You Make a Difference. Um, now, I actually had a conversation on The Right Show with uh, Peter Singer, uh, who wrote a book about effective altruism called The Most Good You Can Do. Um, mm -hmm. So some people listening to this or watching it will be familiar with the concept of effective altruism, but some won't. So why don't you give us your thumbnail defini definition? If you're at a cocktail party and someone says, what is effective altruism? What do you say? It, effective altruism is about using um, your time and money to do as much good as you can. Uh, but not only that, it's about using high quality evidence and careful reasoning to ensure that when you try to do good, you aim to do the most good you can do. Okay. So, yeah, in just the same way that, you know, the Enlightenment gave us methods for getting much better at the pursuit of truth, um, that were impartial and enabled us to find the truth, the, we're trying to, you know, take a similar approach, but to the pursuit of good or pursuit of making the world a better place. Okay. And this is actually kind of a movement, right? I mean, I know a kid who was at Harvard and I, there's some kind of club or something there that he was very involved in. Um, so, so this is n not just a body of ideas. It, it's, it's kind of a thing that's happening. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's um, a community of people all around the world, um, with, including these local groups, often at universities. We've got maybe close to 100 of them now. Um, and people are making really big commitments. Um, people are really taking this seriously, making the ideas of effective altruism a core part of their own lives. Um, that often manifests in giving. So everyone who's a member of Giving What We Can commits to give at least 10% of their income. Some people give a lot more. A number of people, including myself, have pledged to give everything they earn above a certain baseline. So I've pledged to give everything I earn above about $36,000 per year to whatever charities I think are most effective. Other people are setting up projects, starting organizations, or deliberately changing their career in order to ensure that, you know, they're going to be having the biggest impact they can through their work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious, I mean, aside from any good that the movement does, is there good in the movement itself in the sense that, I mean, are people in the movement getting the kind of sense of community out of this and the gratification and you might even say spiritual gratification or something, that people have historically gotten from participation in churches and synagogues and mosques and so on? Yeah, I mean, I can't talk too much to the analogy with synagogues and mosques, but in terms of the kind of community atmosphere, we're, we've definitely built what is quite a tight-knit community because it's a whole number of people, and we all have the shared aim, which is you know making the world as good as we can, focused on issues like extreme poverty, and that means that people really want to help each other out as much as possible. Um, and it also means that the norms now, rather than giving 10% or 50% of your income is a kind of weird thing that you might get somewhat socially shunned for. In fact, it's something that's encouraged and rewarded. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think like a lot of people, myself included, find being part of this community of people, feeling like you're part of this shared project to really make a big impact on some of the world's most pressing problems is extremely rewarding. Yeah. And that, and that itself, the idea of giving a, some percentage of your income, has traditionally been part of like churches and so on. It's called tithing, and and yep. and there's you, often a, st a standard recommended percentage, like ten percent or something. Yeah, that's right. So, and it's not a coincidence that we chose this ten percent figure um, as what we were going to recommend. It has this history behind it, and it also has a kind of middle ground between, um, you know, encouraging people to give significantly more than they would have otherwise done. If we're encouraging 1%, then we're not really changing people's behavior. Yet at the same time being, uh, you know, responsive to the fact that we're all human animals and if we're asking people to give away every last cent just simply isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that. So <laughs> uh, I mentioned Peter Singer. Um, he is a utilitarian in terms of his philosophical outlook. And roughly speaking, you could say that that means that he believes uh, that ethical decisions should be guided by a desire to do the most good for the most people, where good mm -hmm. is defined as something roughly like happiness, although a philosopher would have to get more technical than that. But that'll mm -hmm. do for present 
purposes. Uh, I take it that you are one because I take it that that's kind of the the the, the foundational framework for the whole movement in a sense, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sympathetic to utilitarianism, but um, I think actually when making ethical decisions, you should look at a variety of ethical viewpoints and make a decision that's, uh, you know, the best compromise between them. And I think, while I think utilitarianism entails effective altruism, it's not the only thing, the only moral view that entails it. Um, you could be a Kantian, you could be a virtue ethicist, you could be a contextualist, any other sort of moral view. As long as you think that helping other people is important and it's better to help people by more rather than less, then you're going to be on board with effective altruism. So whereas utilitarianism could say, take any means to this end. So um, kill one person to save five because that's for the greater good. You know, effective altruism. Well, even there, um, a, a, a rule-based utilitarian might say, "Don't do that," as opposed to an act-based utilitarian. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't need to get into that. But there, yeah, I, yeah. I don't think we should unduly taint utilitarians here. Um, the uh, the um, so in the case of virtue ethics, in other words, you, you, then the pitch could be, "Well, I can buy with ten percent of my income, I can increase the amount of." honesty or courage in some African village, depending on what virtue I want to emphasize? You, you, you could think like that and be part of the effective altruism movement? I mean, I actually think the way you'd pitch effective altruism to virtue ethics is to say, well, one of the key virtues is benevolence. Um, and, you know, Aristotle talked about this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even Aristotle talked about how the highest virtue of benevolence uh, benevolence or beneficence isn't just helping whoever is in front of you, but it's being guided by reason when you, you try see. to help others. So it's not so much that you're trying to promote the virtues. I see. I think you'd just be trying to promote people's lives being better off. But just that, like, okay. if you want to talk about virtues, you know, for the richest 5 10% of the world's population, living a virtuous life is going to involve um, helping others who are far poorer than you. Okay. And you can do so at great. Um, so you, so you would use an appeal... Yourself. To virtue, to get them involved in the movement. And once they're involved in the movement, uh, it does seem that kind of in a rough sense, the framework for your analysis here in the book is, is in a vague sense utilitarian, right? I mean, you put a lot of emphasis on how much happier you can make people given their income level and so on for a given, you know, sacrifice of so much income on your part and, and that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, so it's focused on well-being and utilitarians mm -hmm. focus on well-being. Um uh, and it's focused on like improving people's lives as much as possible, which is also what utilitarianism says you should do. The difference is that utilitarianism says that's the only thing you should care about, whereas effective altruism says, look, we're just talking about the. We agree it's one part of a good human, you know, good human life to try and really improve the lives of others, and that's the bit we're talking about. We're not necessarily saying that this is like all there is to living a moral life, but. That's get into the nitty gritty and you're thinking like, okay, what charity should we give to? Then we have to start getting a little bit technical, a little bit mathematical, thinking, answering these really hard questions that are thinking, well, if I can, you know, deworm this many school children or put malarial nets over the heads of this many other children, what should I do? And that involves thinking about the magnitudes of benefits that you're giving to different people. Okay. So before we get into deciding, you know, how you, you spend your charitable money, the case for spending uh, charitable money and maybe more than people are accustomed to spending, part of that case in your book involves this pretty well-established finding now about how, how much your happiness will increase as a result of added income depends on what your income level already is, right? So uh, if you have a, you know, a relatively high income already, another thousand dollars is going to bring you much less happiness than it's going to bring someone uh, maybe on another continent, maybe in your own society, who's, who's making uh, a fifth of what you're making. That's exactly right. Um, the way I cash this out is in terms of what I call the hundredfold multiplier. So in financial terms, someone earning a pretty typical wage in the U.S. is a hundred times richer than the poorest 500 million people in the world. And after we look at what people have found the relationship between income and happiness to be, that means that if you take them, um, you make yourself one dollar poorer, give that dollar to one of these poorest people in the world, you've done a hundred times as much to improve their life 
as you have done to kind of decrease your quality of life. So one dollar will do 100 times as much for the very poorest people in the world as it will for people on typical income in the U.S. Not to mention the fact that the satisfaction of feeling you've done good may make up for whatever you lost by losing the dollar. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, for my giving, that's, I feel like that's made my life better. For most people in the effective autism community, they actually just, yeah, they're now living a life that's more in accordance with their own values. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's like a really satisfying, really exciting thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms of how to, uh, how to decide how to spend the money, let's start with a case that I think illustrates both the, the basic kind of logic you use and, and will probably be a good excuse to talk about some of the kinds of critiques you probably encounter. That's mm -hmm. the case of uh, Michael Creamer, the economist who was studying educational outcomes. I think it was a in Africa, right? In Kenya, that's right. Yep. And he was trying to find ways uh, to increase performance on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right? That's so, right. So, or school attendance, yeah. Or school attendance. Okay, so tell us that story. Yeah, so Michael Kramer, um, uh, he was in uh, Kenya and talking to a charity called ICS that was giving out a package of different programs, uh, like free uniforms, foot charts, and so on, uh, in order to try and improve educational outcomes. And he knew the people there and said, well, you're doing this thing, but you know if it works, why not test it? Seems like a very simple thing to suggest, but actually at the time, you know, within development economics, it was you know, a very new idea. And so, they looked at these two different, you know, they took 14 schools, um, seven of which they said, okay, we'll run out this package of educational programs, seven of which um, uh, we won't, we'll just monitor how do they perform, compare the two to see if this actually works. Um, and they did find that this like whole package did have some effect. But then they started to look at specific things, things that you might think of as just very obvious that they have a really big impact. So giving out textbooks, for example, or... Uh, distributing flip charts or reducing class sizes. Each of these cases, you think, obviously, this is going to improve educational outcomes. But they tried all of these things, and they found no impact each each case, um, even though these are very popular programs, indeed. And it was only when they tested something that seemed quite strange, namely deworming. So most people in the West don't know about it, but over a billion people worldwide suffer from um, intestinal worms, worms that live in your gut, make you very sick. Um, that can be cured for absolute pennies. Uh, he got a tip off from someone at the World Bank saying, well, why not test that, actually? And they did. They administered these deworming drugs en masse to uh, a large number of students um, and compared how were the educational outcomes in those schools that were treated versus the ones that weren't treated. And, yeah, they found they were in a very large effect, indeed. It turned out um, given the results of that study, to be one of the most um, impactful educational programs there is. Um, when it was followed up with later on, so they went back to those same people 10 years later, found very significant increases in number of hours that people were working and the amount they were earning as well. So it had this long-lasting benefit in people's lives. Okay. So I can imagine one kind of feedback you might get is... First of all, are you saying that until everyone on the planet, every student on the planet is dewormed, do, do not spend any money anywhere on more teachers? That uh, the ideal outcome is to take any money anyone would have spent on more teachers uh, and, and, and divert the money to a, a kind of a medical use. Yeah, so it depends exactly what we're talking about. If you're thinking about what's my own donation, then, yeah, I think you should spend all of that on deworming rather than teachers, for example, at the moment. Um, if I was then talking to the Kenyan government and they were saying, oh, should we just completely cut off funding for teachers and only fund deworming? Uh, firstly, I think that would be a false dichotomy. You can easily do both, even as the Kenyan government. Um, but then also it would be like the kind of intervention of just removing teachers is very different from the intervention of kind of adding teachers or adding textbooks and so on. So I'd be more cautious about that. But in general, yeah, what we want to do is focus on the most effective things until that's no longer the most effective. Then focus on the most second effect, the second most effective program until that's no longer second most effective, and so on. And why should the ethical guidance be different for the Kenyan government? I mean, shouldn't they also be interested in doing the most good? Oh, I think the difference that I was drawing was just whether 
is it the case that we're adding teachers or is it the case that we're taking okay, away so teachers? That's... And those are just two different things, yeah. So you would say to the Kenyan government, do not add any more teachers until you've gotten rid of all the worms. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what the evidence suggests okay. is the best thing to do. And, and <clears throat> I guess one thing some people might say is, wait a second, although this particular standardized test didn't show a, show a strong effect um, for more teachers being added, um, you know, standardized tests don't capture everything. And even what they're trying to capture isn't everything, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in other words, you, you know, most of us have had important teachers in our lives that sent us on a particular trajectory. And you can imagine it being the case that if you double the number of teachers in a school, more kids are going to have the kind of exposure that uh, will put them on, you know, some give them some kind of burning aspiration that will pay off uh, in a way that will not be evident for 10 years. It'll have to do with their career trajectory and, and, and so on, right? I mean, the, the, what, what Creamer was measuring wouldn't have captured that, right? Yeah, so there's this general issue of like ensuring you measure the right things, ensuring um, that the studies you run are replicable in you know, other contexts and other environments, ensuring it's not just a statistical fluke. So I definitely don't want to convey that I think that you know, a single randomized control trial, especially is absolutely everything, definitely going to um, capture all we want. Um, but it's definitely like very compelling evidence. And so if, and also the thing to bear in mind is that most social programs just don't actually have an impact on anything really. Mm -hmm. So when tested, 75% of social programs just don't have, um, a positive impact at all on the thing and the very thing they're trying to improve. And so it might be the case that, you know, adding more teachers have, um, these kind of transformational effects. Uh, I think a big problem actually is just that teachers don't even turn up to school, so um, it's hard hard for the transformational effects to happen when that's the case. But uh, maybe that's the case. But now we're in a situation where you can say, okay, well, there's one one program that maybe has this transformational benefit, but that's just speculation to think so. Or this other program where we have like very high um, evidence for thinking actually no, this does have this amazing improvement in terms of people's quality of life that we know about in a long time period. And in that case, it seems to me like you should go for the thing where there's just, you know, the strong evidence behind it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So kind of related to that question is a question I actually did ask uh, Peter Singer when he was on, which is, is there a danger that the effect of altruism movement will channel uh, funding kind of excessively into certain kinds of spaces where results are readily quantifiable. And the, mm -hmm. the, the example I'd give, I mean, I, I think maybe the biggest problem, well, in a, the most potentially apocalyptic problem maybe in the world is kind of the psychology of tribalism as it's playing out in various ways, sectarian conflict, nationalistic mm -hmm. conflict, even ideological conflict within the United States is getting kind of very intense and kind of mm -hmm. scary. Now, uh, when you look at like what you might do to start trying to address the issue of uh, the psychology of tribalism, I mean, I think psychology tells us a lot. We know more and more about cognitive biases that aid in the bet tribalism. You can think of various interventions, but it's a pretty amorphous thing. I mean, and much mm -hmm. related to it is just, you know, we're talking about hatred in many cases. That's a pretty amorphous thing. Uh, and there is the further fact that my conjecture would be that uh, this is one of those things where um, there's kind of a slippery slope. In other words, if it gets much worse, you can imagine things spinning out of control through positive feedback systems of various unfortunate kinds and so on. At least I'd make that claim. So th there's that additional problem that, mm -hmm. that actually the short-term damage being done, if it's indeed a positive feedback system, uh, understates the amount of long-term damage implied by the short-term damage, if you know what I mean. So it's just mm -hmm. a super complicated thing that I think needs addressing, but I cannot imagine making a case using the tools of effective altruism, you know, with, with really precise quantification of some near-term outcome that would actually succeed in getting someone to provide money for this. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So it's, it's a great question and it's definitely a, it's very much kind of in house, uh, question and debate for effective altruism, which is like, 
how much, because effective altruism isn't quantified altruism. It's trying to do the most good, whether that's quantified or not. Uh, but then there's a big like internal debate about, well, how much do you just want to say, no, just it has to be measurable, has to be numbers versus something that might be more speculative, but higher payoff. Um, and we do, you know, within the community, there is a bunch of focus on things that are more speculative, like immigration reform, criminal justice reform, certain kind of risks from new technology or potentials from new technology, certain areas of research as well. Um, and in fact, a lot of people in the effective autism community are excited by the idea of promoting values like anti-tribalism. Um, you know, and in fact, the promotion of the idea of effective altruism is something a lot of effective altruists do and think it's good precisely because, um, uh, you know, because of these long-run effects. And I even think of effective altruism as the opposite of tribalism, both ideological tribalism and, um, you know, nationalism and other sorts and of... And I suppose, I suppose the effective altruists themselves do not constitute a tribe in any dangerous sense in your view. Yeah, you could call it a tribalist tribe or something. Um, That's a term I've tried to popularize to no great effect so far. Yeah, well, maybe one one day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone has to have their own identity. But if you're like, and your identity can be, um, you can have the identity of someone who doesn't take a tribal identity. Um, and then maybe you can win in that sort of way. Right. So, you know, so it's a potential. It's kind of, it's on the table. And we don't want to rule it out just because it's not easy to quantify but then we'd want to, but it doesn't mean we have to be completely irrational. You can look at, okay, what's the history of social change? How does this work? Um, is it completely chaotic? Um, you know, there's a whole ton of evidence there um, of the things that we've done so far. How much of that, co how much does that cost? What's been the impact um, of the things we're promoting? What's the kind of cost per person who now just says they're no longer a tribalist, but used to be a tribalist beforehand? Measure how does that ch turn into behavior change? So, I mean, we do that with respect to when we're promoting the ideas of effective altruism. We can look at, for example, you know, how many people are taking a 10% pledge, um, you know, how much is that worth and so on. And so even if you can't be perfectly quantified, I think you can still be more or less rational. Um, and uh, I think, you know, at least we can start having like, maybe it's impossible to get to a definitive answer, but you can have a better or worse, like, honest discussion about whether this is going to be the best thing. So, so you can actually, are you saying you can actually have a discussion in the extreme case that involves nothing immediately quantifiable? Uh, yeah. Within, within, and, 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 with, and this is within the framework of effective altruism. And, the, and, and if so, the distinguishing characteristic, the thing that makes it effective altruism is just that it's as rational as possible and makes as much appeal to existing evidence as possible. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we just want to be, you know, as, um, like, as scientific as you can be. So, like, you know, psychology is not as scientific as um, physics is, so it's not able to have the sort of same standards for evidence. But you can still try and do your darn best to understand the mind in a scientific way. And, you know, effective altruism attempts to do good. Um, definitely not as scientific or as meaningful to scientific method as physics is, but again, you can still try and do your, your darn best. And I think even on these things that people think of as highly unquantifiable, you know, like immigration reform or so on, you can actually make quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of progress on this. Mm -hmm. And a kind of related thing, you, 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 uh, well, you mentioned prison reform. So, um, I think a related thing some people might say is like issues like prison reform, you know, injustice in their country or income inequality within their country. Mm -hmm. You know, they might they might say there there are almost intangibly destructive effects of those things and of injustice in their country. Uh, right. That that. In other words, even if a poor person, I'm just thinking through this. I haven't thought about this before, mm -hmm. so it may make no sense. But even if a relatively poor person in the United States is not nearly as poor as somebody in Africa, they might say that income inequality in the United States has such corrosive effects and such possibly long term kind of ominous effects that, that there's the case for addressing that at home. Now, I, I would personally be suspicious of the mm -hmm. tendency to want to just address problems at home precisely because it might result from a certain kind of tribalism. But, um, but what do you, does that come up? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. Yeah. So we've got a, so we call these flow through or knock on effects where you can do something that's, you know, focused on a rich country, but it's, it's good because of the effects it has on other countries. So, 
Um, maybe you want to push for voting reform or electoral reform or money in politics um, uh, in the US. Uh, and But you think that's really good because it means that you else will stop going to war with other countries, which is like politically very destabilizing on a global scale, but, you know, causes huge numbers of deaths and so on. Um, that like line of arguments, like perfectly reasonable. Um, and again, you know, we make use of it. Um, 80,000 hours gives career advice to include, like including people attending Ivy leagues. It's not because we want to benefit them, but because they've got the potential to do so much good in the future. Uh, where I think we should be skeptical is if you have a pre-existing cause that you're very excited about and passionate about and attached to, and then you discover a whole new bunch of considerations. And then on the basis of those new considerations conclude that the same cause you were um, endorsing before is also the best one, but just for completely different reasons than you thought. Statistically, that would just be very unlikely to happen. It's the same as saying like, I found the tallest man, and then like, oh, but we were looking for the heaviest man. And say, oh, he's also the heaviest man. It'd be very unlikely. Um, so the best thing that's the thing that's going to be best at improving the lives of the poor in the U.S. is just not going to be the best thing that's going to be the best at improving the lives of pe poor people worldwide. Um, be very surprising if that was true. Right. Okay. So you, you're um, you 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 have some kind of counterintuitive uh, recommendations, or at least or at least. Uh, guidance in the book that goes against some of the conventional wisdom in liberal circles. Um, fair trade, the fair mm -hmm. trade movement. Uh, you know, my, my, uh, my wife ensures that a fair amount of the stuff in our cupboard uh, was not produced mm -hmm. under un what are deemed unduly oppressive conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's the whole kind of sweatshop, anti-sweatshop mm -hmm. movement. And, and you, you have some, uh, some things, things to say about say. all this, right? Yeah, so with respect to fair trade and ethical consumption, in principle, perfectly in favor of it. Um, if I could have a product where it was guaranteed that the coffee I bought was coming from the poorest countries in the world and the money was actually, like, it was just paying farmers more for this, um, then, you know, I'd just be in favor of it. So I think, but fair trade, I think, is a very bad implementation of this idea for a few reasons. Um, firstly, just fair trade certification is hard to get. That means um, a large proportion, I think a slight majority of uh, produce comes from middle-income countries rather than the very poorest countries in the world. Countries that are kind of 10 times richer than Ethiopia or Kenya. And so that makes a big difference in terms of the impact of um, that money you're spending, of those wages. So wait, let, let um, me be clear here. Is, is, the, yeah. is the problem that uh, places where conditions prevail that satisfy the fair trade certifiers tend to be just tend to be not the poorest countries precisely because you see higher standards of labor and so on in more affluent countries. Is that what's going on? That's exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah. So it's just harder for the poorest countries. So, so if you want to help the poorest people in the world, sense. you're going to have to go to a country where there are not very high labor standards for starters. That's right. Okay. And that's like the process by which you get higher labor standards is the country getting richer. Um, but there's a couple of other things that I think are even more problematic with fair trade. Um, one is just that, uh, I mean, we know very little about how this money actually transfers in terms of increased incomes to the poor. In the single largest study, um, you know, and in the basis of general literature reviews, uh, it seems like the amount of the markup on fair trade coffee, um, as an example, uh, of that markup, something like 4 to 15% actually makes it to the coffee producers. And when studied, it seemed like the conclusion was that, so it's already a very small amount that's going to the producers. But when studied, the impact on the wages seemed to be zero. So uh, fair trade coffee farmers, who are the poorest people in this equation, weren't making any more money than non-fair trade farmers. But then the very final thing, the worst thing of all, I think, is just the way the model works, is that fair trade gives coffee producers $2, um, oh no, sorry, depends exactly on what the product is, but will pay above the market price for a particular good and will ensure that the price never goes below a certain um, low bar. And even just very basic economics shows that that means that you are harming non-fair trade farmers because they're going to be supplying more than the market wants because they're paid more than the market price that means the market is swamped, um, non-fair trade farmers can't compete and they're put out of business. So um, 
it's like, you know, it's a reasonable idea in principle, but I think kind of badly implemented. Well, would you go so far as to say, given the uh, available, the menu of options you face when you go to the store, <clears throat> um, and even if you can choose what whatever store you go to, um, you're best off going the corporate route. Like Maxwell House can be trusted to go to the country with the lowest labor standards, which is going to mean going to the poorest country where where the workers, however little they may make compared to you, are most in need of income. Is it would you would you go to the the that extreme? Yeah, so I mean, tr- I'd want- trust the corporations to find the most exploitive conditions because. Workers living under those conditions most need what income they will get from the work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not exploitive to just impl- like employ kind of voluntary labor, even if that is like very low amounts of money by our standards. Right. Because, because uh, the worker is making the decision that it's better than the other available options in that worker's life. That's right. So when we think, so, you know, we think about the working conditions in very poor countries, and they often talk about sweatshops, and they're often absolutely horrific, and everyone agrees with that. But the thing that people don't realize is that the alternatives are worse. So um, uh, what we call sweatshop labor, especially from international organizations, um, is typically paid um, much higher than um, other domestic jobs. It's much better than unemployment, backbreaking farm labor, um, prostitution, scavenging, that are often the kind of alternatives for people who are taking these jobs. And these jobs are just freely chosen. Um, and so, and then when we look on a macro scale as well, so look at the countries that are like the real success stories of development in the 20th century, South Korea, Taiwan, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, there was a lot of um, industrialization in that, a lot of use of sweatshop, of what get called sweatshops. Um, but now the economic powerhouses move beyond that. So if you think sweatshops are terrible places to work, you're right. But the solution is to make them um, no longer desirable places to work for the people who are extremely poor, for who actually do think of these as the good jobs. Mm-hmm. And I guess this could be a place where another kind of argument about intangibles enters, which is this, which is if you leave it to corporations to find the, the cheapest labor, um, that will lead to the most rapid cultural change in the country, whereas whereas a fair trade arrangement might do more to preserve existing kind of structures of you know farms and the social structures surrounding them or something. And this argument would go: there's something disruptive about rapid cultural change that doesn't that you can't measure in terms of, uh, of average you know per capita GDP. But that leads to other kinds of uh, other kinds of problems. Yeah, I mean, like maybe it's an argument you could make. I mean, we'd need to think that the cultural exchange is bad. I mean, in general, I'm kind of in favor of cultural exchange because people can choose the bits of the culture they want to keep that are good and leave behind the bits of culture that are bad. Um, uh, and, you know, this always happens both ways um, between different cultures. Uh, and then the quite second question would be, like, well, is fair trade decreasing the amount of cultural exchange? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd find it kind of hard to see how it, how it would be, actually. It's not, really, it's not really its kind of mission. You could think of maybe other things that are trying to increase, like decreasing the amount of globalization. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even talking about necessarily cultural change so, so fast. It's just the velocity of transformation. Like, mm-hmm. it takes a while to catch up. <clears throat> Uh, you know, it happens eventually. Like in the United States, kind of famously, like there was this rapid urbanization and there's novels that attest, written at the time, like Sister Carrie, that attest to some of the problems that that caused. Eventually, you know, through, through, largely through a kind of a lack of uh, community, there was not a transplantation of the kind of community that existed in a rural context to urban environments immediately. But then these organizations arose, the YMCA and so on. So it kind of works out in the long run. But but there are these transitional difficulties as part of the argument, I think. And and often a, a failure to take account of environmental externalities and so on on the part of the government. And anyway, that's we needn't mm-hmm. dwell on it, but I think that's the kind of that's kind of argument you might hear. Yeah, I think it's like like maybe there's something to it. I mean, I think the other thing is just like uh you know, for these countries and for these people, like just the number one issue is growth. I mean you know, 
nine, like 99 of the people's problems are related to just lack of resources. They don't have enough money. They don't have clean water. They can't, they aren't well fed. They die of very easily preventable diseases. Um, and so, you know, I bet fairly good money that if you'd actually go and just like talk to, um, talk to people and say, well, how much do you care about, you know, cultural disruption or like faster change in exchange for, um, you know, actually having a like table to sit on and a metal roof or um, not having to die of easily preventable diseases. You know, the trade-off would be like rather clear, I think. Okay. Now on to another in your list of counterintuitive suggestions. If you're watching TV and there's been an earthquake somewhere or something and there are these people suffering, whatever you do, do not help them. Is that a fair summary of... Uh... <laughs> Um, <laughs> is that an unfair characterization? Anyway, what you say wait. is uh, don't donate to disaster relief is actually one of your rules, right? Yeah. So um, uh, the thing to say, so obviously disaster relief should get funding. Um, obviously, it's important to respond to disasters. The question is just you kind of as an individual, given that you know how everyone else is going to act, should you donate to disaster relief? And the answer there, I think, is no rather than donating to what I would call ongoing natural disasters like malaria, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, neglected tropical diseases. And the reason is just that nat widely publicized natural disasters get far more funding um, per person affected than what the news doesn't cover, which is, um, you know, the thousand children every day who die of malaria, um, the hundreds of thousands of people who die every year of um, HIV AIDS with tuberculosis um, and because they just are ongoing people don't they don't get coverage but they're just as bad in fact they're far worse they kill far more people um, the amount of suffering is far greater from these causes than they are from natural disasters and because they get less publicity they get a lot less funding um, per person affected and that means that you can do a lot more good because the lowest hanging fruit as it were the kind of easy wins in terms of improving people's lives is like just paying for bed nets and putting them over children's heads has not been have not been taken. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the uh, one area you get into a little bit is animal suffering. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if that's one of your concerns, and and you you do some interesting kind of analysis. I mean, I think most people are not aware. They don't think think through the implications. Like you eat so much chicken and so much beef, you know, how much damage are you doing? Uh, what mm -hmm. what is your what is your finding in that area? Yeah, so what I conclude is that um, uh, if you're concerned by animal suffering, and given the way that animals suffer in factory farms, I think we all really would be if we knew the facts about it, uh, it's actually much more important to cut out chicken from your diet than it is to cut out beef in particular. And there are just two reasons for this. One is just the conditions that chickens are kept in are far, far worse than the conditions um, cows are kept in. Um, and then secondly is just in terms of the amount of calories a particular um, kind of creature produces, as it were. So, a family can, kind of a family, can family can eat a whole chicken in one meal, whereas um, eating a cow takes, um, you know, very, very many. Um, the amount of impact you have on a cow's life through a liter of milk is far, far smaller. Right. So, there's, so a, if we're, yeah, there's, there's a number in there, like I think maybe it's the average American or something eats, I don't know, a couple hundred chickens a year and one tenth of a cow or something like that. Right, yeah, so it's about thirty chickens, maybe a tenth of a cow. Oh, thirty right. chickens. Okay. Of course, there is the complicated question of like quality of sentience. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, chicken versus cow. Who knows? Yeah. But I mean, there's some some level at which you would say it matters less. Like if we're talking about snails, I think we we'd all agree that's a less acute problem than chicken suffering. But I just throw that in there as an asterisk. I don't think we'll get to the bottom of that. Yeah, it's an extremely difficult philosophical problem. I think is just chickens what, versus cows. What's it like to be a chicken? What's it like to be a cow? How important is it to save a chicken's life versus a cow's life or like prevent chicken suffering and cow suffering? And it isn't uh, ju it's not just eating chickens, right? I mean, it's eggs. Yeah, eggs as well. I mean, battery hen eggs have the worst lives of probably any creatures on the planet. Um, so I think that when, you know, when battery hen chickens are, hens are killed at the end of their life, I think that's the best thing that ever happened to them. Um, but if my wife buys eggs, as she does, from, like, free-range chicken farms or whatever, we're okay? Yeah, in the, U in the UK, that would be true. In the US, um, 
in general free range doesn't really mean what it, people think it means. It means access to free, free range, which is mean that the chicken that the chickens can see daylight. Oh my uh, gosh, that's not as in, that's almost worse. Yeah, you can think of a huge barn and then um, like a little gate and then a kind of two meter by two meter thing. Like, well, it, so is there no label in America that's used that signifies actually good treatment for chickens? Not any common ones, not that I know of. I mean, in general, just animal welfare standards in the U.S. are far behind those of... Um, so you'd have to know your local farm. I mean, you'd have to do... Re- which, knowing my wife, she's probably done. But I, but but uh, you could do that. There are local farms you could actually learn about. Yeah, that, that's true. And there, when it's talking about... When you're talking about, you know... Chickens had a good life, lays eggs, take the eggs. Like, um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, some moral philosophers still object to that, but it's just a very different um, kettle of fish than, you know, eating eggs from battery hen chickens, which is just so morally kind of uncontroversially bad to do, I think. Mm, okay. So um, you, a number of your chapters have kind of as, as uh, subheads uh, particular questions one of the questions is, is this the most effective thing you can do? Which mm-hmm. involves an appraisal of yourself, among other things, right? And your, your mm-hmm. possible trajectories in life and so on. How, how does, talk about that a little. Yeah, I mean, so the key thing that I'm emphasizing in that chapter and with that question is the distinction between making a difference and making the most difference. So a lot of people say they want to do good, they want to have an impact. Um, but there it's like the decision decision is just between am I doing something good or am I doing nothing? But um, actually what matters is, is this the best thing relative to the other options? Because even among different ways of doing good, the very best opportunities are far, far greater, like a hundred times more effective than merely kind of very good ones. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't just think about, oh, this is, you know, this is having an impact. We've got to think about, well, is this actually the very best thing I can do? And that's quite different. And, I mean, Peter Singer gets into the question of whether you should – well, first of all, he, he kind of makes a case against um, – well, he says you should be skeptical of trying to do good by joining a nonprofit as mm-hmm. opposed to going and making a lot of money and donating it, right? Mm-hmm. Because – and I'm sure that <clears throat> case itself is relatively straightforward if you're talking about making enough money and donating it. But I guess my question would be, how often do good intentions go awry? I mean, I noticed uh, your two NGOs, uh, it says on your book jacket, have uh, 400 million lifetime pledged donations mm-hmm. to charity. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, kind of part of the question is how confident are you that the pledges are going to actually they're gonna actually cough up the money by the end? Uh, yep. And relatedly, you know, given the human capacity for self-deception and the way that our, our lives may take turns we don't expect and our values may change if we get married or something, you know, should people really head out to Wall Street to make money convinced that, that you know, they're going to they're gonna give it all away? Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. So this was a question that um, was very much on our minds as well. And so we've been promoting similar ideas since 2009, 2011. And one of the questions, so yeah, one was with a 10% pledge, how much are people going to follow through with that? <laughs> Secondly, for people we say are earning to give, that is they're deliberately taking a high earning career to donate more, are they going to follow through with it? And uh, with respect to, say, 80,000 hours, you know, we had a kind of long incubation phase of saying, okay, well, some people are going to try this, let's see how it pans out. Um, at the moment, it seems to me... Um, you know, we gather data on this as well. And the attrition rate is just very low indeed. Um, actually, surprisingly low. So um, of the people going through the 80,000 hours community, I don't really know um, of anyone who's just burned out from earning to give. I know people who said, okay, earning to give is not for me. I'm going to go do something else that's valuable with my time. And they go do it, something that's more directly valuable. That certainly happens. I don't know of anyone, though, who's just said, okay, well, I now just really like this high life. I'm going to give up on donating. And how long, um, how, how long a time span is this? This is since, uh, since 2009 or so? Yeah, so we're talking about five years, yeah. Okay. Um, similarly, then, with the 10% pledges, the traditional rate um, is kind of surprisingly low. In fact, the average kind of amount donated per member is a bit above what people say that they donate. 
So some people donate less, of course, but other people donate considerably more. And is there a mechanism that encourages compliance with a promise? I mean, do you send out emails or do they get together with other people in their community who have made the pledge or, or anything like this? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, we all try and tie ourselves to the mass. So everyone who takes the pledge, you know, the name goes on the Giving What We Can website. Um, so it's this public thing. You know, have it so it looks, ba- you know, you feel bad, feel embarrassed if you don't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, then, yeah, we have an annual review, an annual survey where um, we ask all the members to fill in just, you know, how much did they give this year? Was this 10%? Um, have they fulfilled their commitment? So that we can be this kind of constant reminder. And people say, like, you know, they really like that. They want to get nagged because it's easy to kind of, you know, dealing with finances is never the most pleasant thing. So it's nice to have someone to kind of remind them now and again. But if they do uh, lapse, you don't you don't do like public shaming. (laughs) You don't like spray paint selfish on their house or anything like that. No, with old carrots for no sticks. Mm -hmm. I recommend the spray painting uh, (laughs) thing. Uh. Okay, so um, you've got a, a chapter where you talk about um, what economists call, I think, expected return mm-hmm. and what gamblers call expected return. But, but, but the, the, the idea is that it can make sense to donate money to things that have a very low probability of doing any good at all under certain mm-hmm. circumstances, right? Talk about that. Yeah, so – you know, this relates to your earlier questions where you're talking about, well, what about these measurable things versus non-measurable? Well, one way we can start to make progress on this is with this idea of expected return. So if I get tell, say, tell you, okay, give me a dollar and I'll flip a coin. If it's heads, I'll give you $5. If it's tail, I'll keep the dollar. Then you would take that bet. And the reason for that is like it's a 50-50 chance. 50% chance of $5 is 25 that's a lot more than $1. So the expected monetary return is very good. Uh, We can apply, and this is absolutely standard account of decision-making under uncertainty when you don't know exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly what gamblers use, it's what scientists use, what economists use. And we can think of just the same thing. So you think, okay, there's this moonshot project um, of uh, some, let's say, some big policy change. Uh, And... I think, you know, it's probably not going to work. It's just very ambitious. Um, but I can work out, at least fairly approximately, what the odds of it's going to work. I can try and work out how good would this be if it did work. And then I can work out what's the expected value. So if it's, um, you know, a 1% chance of saving 100,000 lives, um, that's as good as having a guarantee of saving 1,000 lives, or at least approximately. You can start to get into that mm-hmm. kind of ballpark. And are there examples uh, out there of, of causes that are, that are uh, you know, high return if successful, but, but low chances of success? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. So, I mean, I think of things like pandemics, for example, um, whether natural. So, and I'm thinking the things that really concern me aren't things like Ebola, actually, but things more like the Spanish flu, which killed 30 million people, could be other things on a similar scale. They could also potentially be man-made pandemics. So, uh, you know, our ability to create novel pathogens is increasing and increasing. Um, I think we should be, obviously, like synthetic biology has like great potential upsides and amazing applications. But we should also be worried about us creating viruses that could kill very large numbers of people. Mm -hmm. And so if we engage in certain policies or activities to try and limit that as much as possible, limit that as much as possible, you know, I do think all of these things are pretty unlikely. So I think it's unlikely that they're going to have um, a huge payoff because probably it's we're all going to just be fine. But there is some chance. And if we are, you know, if this policy of this activity that we do was the thing that made the difference between um, uh, this, you know, huge virus and hundreds of millions of people dying um, and not, then it would be an absolutely massive kind of upside. Yeah. Um, and then similarly for research funding as well as like this, most research um, doesn't have the sort of impact that the very most important research does, but it's still worth funding because maybe it is um, in that kind of huge upside category. Yeah. So, so this, yeah, this is my feeling about the tribalism issue I talked about earlier is that if there are these positive feedback cycles and, you know, the, the tribalism could get worse and worse, and then it intersects with, like, weapons of mass destruction. You could have an apocalyptic outcome. My view is, like, even things that may seem to have a, a low chance of success, even, like, preliminary research and preliminary, you know, 
trying different things could actually make sense if there's a plausibly apocalyptic outcome. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, another very clear count example is like asteroids or something. So you can just work out fairly precisely yeah. the chance of an asteroid slaking the Earth every year. <clears throat> you can work out how much does it cost. I mean, we've already spent this money. We've done it. Um, how much does it cost to ensure that we detect all the asteroids so that we could take early um, uh, um, early action? It's almost certain that um, we're not going to get hit by an asteroid in the next few hundred years, but it's possible, and it would be the end of the world. So it's very high upside indeed, um, especially when you think not just of the seven billion people that would die, but like the entire future human story that could last for millions right. of years. Right. Um, then true. the upside is just fairly clear. True, true apocalypse is a very bad outcome when you yeah, when so. you when you add up all the uh, forms of sentient life that would have would have existed otherwise. Um, yeah, exactly. The uh, so so back to kind of medical research. So a long shot research research that has almost no that has very low chance of uh, curing a disease can make sense uh, so long as a sufficient number of people could be affected by the disease. I guess that's particularly true <laughs> of. Uh, of uh, epidemics, as you said, the, the, now some people might want to apply that to justify cancer research. I suspect you would be skeptical of that partly on the, on the grounds of like the, where cancer is a problem and where <clears throat> it's not right. And most of the world, people are lucky to get to an age where they could plausibly get cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. what, what is your feeling on, on the money that's been spent on cancer research? Yeah, so, I mean, my view is it's, you know, it's a good use of money. The question is just whether it's the best use of money. And I think, and obviously cancer is this absolutely huge problem, um, one of the biggest killers in the world. Um, uh, the question, though, is just, again, like, what's my money going to do on the margin? And really very vast amounts of money are spent on cancer um, research. Uh, and, you know, it's a very familiar area for philanthropic funding. Obviously, there's just huge market demand for cancer treatments because it's people in the rich countries. And so that's why I'd be surprised if it was the case that, um, you know, cancer research was one of the most effective things you could fund rather than, say, malarial research or um, something affecting, uh, you know, nearly as many people but with a tiny amount of the research funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh I guess the last thing, I, I, as long as you've already said a few things uh, that will get you in trouble with some people, including what you just said about cancer research, might as well try for one more. I, I asked this of Peter Singer, it, you know, is an implication of your analysis that uh, basically we should, no one should donate any money to the arts? Um, so again, I want to distinguish between what everyone should do and what I should do on the margin, because these are just very different. You know, one of the principles of my book is just that we should think on the margin. That means given what everyone else should do, what ought you to do? And there the answer is just clearly, yeah. You mean given what everyone else is doing? Sorry, given what everyone else is doing, uh -huh. what, should, what should I do? And the arts are extremely well funded um, relative to, you know, I think their benefit on the human Although race. Although if everyone followed your advice, they <clears> wouldn't be, and you'd probably still say don't <laughs> donate to them, right? I mean... So I, mean, I would start changing my um, advice. But then also, yeah, I mean, like most modern, you know, the big museums, I think MoMA counts as this, um, how much of their collection do they show? Less, considerably less than 1%. Most of it just sits underground <laughs> being extraordinarily expensive. Is that so they true? Make money. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's just a, the whole thing is just And insane. then what, do they rotate it or what? I mean, they rotate a fairly small proportion of it. But well, they don't what, what's, the, it. what's the logic behind keeping it? It's just kind of like an endowment, something. I don't get it. Um, it's unclear to me as well, but they just don't standard kind of operation for the museums that they don't sell off um, art that they possess. That's not a way that they can make money, even though they will never show that to the wider public. And even though if it was just sold privately, at least some people would get to see it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all actually by the by. But um. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in the perfect world, so now we're going to imagine this world where everyone's acting morally, um, mm -hmm. everyone's acting as they should. Yes, there will be art in that world. It's a way of enriching the human life and so on. In a world where um, hundreds of millions of people are living on the equivalent of $1.90 per day, that's what $1.90 would mean in the US right now, then, like, does it seem, like, unduly extravagant that we're funding the opera? Yes, it does. Um, Absolutely. Right. 
And maybe you can close uh, on that note of, of just appreciating how relatively well off most of us are. I mean, you said in the book, uh, if you're making 52000 a year, you are in the upper 1%. Globally. That's exactly right. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk for the 1%. That normally focuses on um, you know, domestic inequality, inequality in the U.S., but that just pales in comparison to global inequality. And uh, you know, everyone in, almost everyone in the U.S. basically is in the richest 10% of the world's population. If you're earning above yeah, $52,000 per year as an individual, then you're in the richest 1% of the world's population. Mm-hmm. Um, so the amount of good that we are able to do as a result of that is absolutely huge. It means that by using your money to benefit the poorest people in the world, you can have an absolutely massive, you know, absolutely massive difference. You can literally save someone's life for 2,000 pounds. So and imagine that, you know, just imagine you're walking past that past a building that was on fire. You can run in, kick the door down, save the child that was in that building. You know, that would stay with you for the rest of your life. What all of these numbers show is that you can just do that every single year of your life just by choosing to spend some of your money in a different way. Um, you know, that's really, like, that's really pretty incredible. That's a pretty amazing opportunity, and I think we should take it. All right. Well, thank you, and thanks for writing the book. It's called Doing Good Better, How Effective Altruism can help you make a difference. And you are the author, William McCaskill. Terrific. Thanks, Bob. All right. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Maybe we'll uh, have another conversation down the road. That'd be great. Take care.